Hi guys, welcome back. So as you can see by the title of this lecture, we're going to focus today on the TENI type. And for our first sample, we have here Ben Shapiro. Well, it depends on, on what. So what I've called myself is sometimes Trump. Okay, they're, they're, people have said there's never Trump and then there's always Trump. Sometimes Trump meaning that when he does something that I like. So first, the J.E. Voltology, we already see an abundance of head shakes and head nods, for example, here. Trump. Okay, you see that? People said there's never Trump and then there's always and Trump. And in the hands, meaning that gesticulation. When he does something that I like, I cheer. And when he does something that I hate, which happens. Very strong way of asserting the head pushes and the head rattles and the hands projecting out as well as the voice, which is very articulate. So he has all of the signals present of J.E. He has that very assertive, militant energy to him. Notice the way his mouth wobbles and it kind of rises upwards. 100 officers to protect me at Berkeley. Yes, it's an elephant and an elephant. Yeah, that can only be from T.E. Exactly. So that's what we call the dismissiveness and the snippiness or sassiness of T.E. So he has all of that as well as the mouth tension, which completes the axes of T.E. and F.I. As for his perception axis, we see here that he has a taut orbital area, which means that the orbital area, the outer area of the orbicularis muscle is taut. And you can see here as well, he has moments where he raises his eyebrows, but also his eyes are somewhat hooded in a hypnotic way by the upper eyelid. So we see the snippiness and sassiness and assertion that we saw with the TESIs, however, with the ocular tension, um, not resembling the TESIs, but more resembling the FENI. So now we have to ask the question, now that we're looking at this intersectional type that has properties of TE, but also of NI, would the psychology also match the combination of those two things in the ways that we would expect based on what we've seen so far? So that's something that we're going to explore in this video and see what comes out. Now let's start focusing on the psychology. So I'm going to rewind here. Well, it depends on, on what. So what I've called myself is sometimes Trump. Okay, they're, they're, people have said there's never Trump and then there's always Trump. Sometimes Trump meaning that when he does something that I like, I cheer, and when he does something that I hate, which happens, then I boo, and I'm booing as loudly as you are when he does something that's really bad. But listen, you're very upset about this Supreme Court nominee. I am very pleased about this. mean that I am cheering his character because I think that it is very difficult to cheer Donald Trump's character, nor do I think it's appropriate. And to me, to watch so many Republicans do. So here he's expressing his support of Donald Trump in certain things that he does. Ben Shapiro is an American conservative political commentator, media host, attorney, and columnist. Republican conservative, political commentator, attorney, and columnist. Let's continue. Character, because I think that it is very difficult to cheer Donald Trump's character, nor do I think it's appropriate. And to me, to watch so many Republicans do exactly that. I've been incredibly critical of Republicans who have suddenly become fans of Vladimir Putin or have suddenly become fans of, of tariffs. I, I think all of that is idiocy. So one thing about him, he says, is that he supports Donald Trump a, a lot of cases in his policies and his uh, choices, but it doesn't really care about his character. He just cares about the results in a way. And this leads to another known thing about Ben Shapiro, and that is that he seems to be very uh, no bullshit when it comes to these social dynamics, which interfere with what would otherwise be a more dispassionate take on the facts. So for example, he's famously known for this phrase, facts don't care about your feelings. And this is definitely an attitude that is part of his psychology, part of his personality. So I'm gonna write this down. Indifference towards social rapport and priority over facts. Facts don't care about your feelings. But again, I think that with regard to judges, with regard to taxes, with regard to uh, Middle Eastern policy, particularly Iran and Israel, I'm much more of a fan of President Trump than, I mean, I would say some circumstance, but the Democratic Party would have to stop being insane. He's not afraid to call people insults out loud. So he's very blunt. Uh, let me put that here. And I actually believe a lot of the damage that he has done to the country in terms of social fabric has already occurred. So I, I said I didn't vote for him in 2016. The reason I didn't vote for him in 2016 is because I feared the damage he would do to the social fabric. And I also didn't think he was going to govern conservatives. So we see that same political orientation that we see in most all conductor types where they focus a lot on social politics and where things are headed and what things can be done to improve the social situation. And, conservative. and as far as the damage to the social fabric, if he's already done it, I'm not actually mitigating against the damage to the social fabric by not voting from in 2020. Okay, stepping back from the video for a moment, we also know that uh, Ben Shapiro is an author and he's written a book called The Right Side of History, How Reason and Moral Purpose Made the West Great. There again, we see that focus on reason. He's a very rationally minded individual. So how reason and moral purpose made the West great? Okay, 
I think that's enough motifs for now. There's much more that can be said about Ben Shapiro because he has an entire show with hundreds of videos and I encourage anybody to watch them for an example of a certain shade of TENI. But let's go on to the next sample now. So the next sample we have is Julian Goertz. I think that China is attempting to run a bit of a natural experiment in what we might think of as a more authoritarian innovation driven economy. So first off we see an abundance of wobbling lips. In what we might see for example here the way the tension comes and goes on the sides up and also on the bottom. These little bulges come in and out because there's a contraction, contraction, contraction happening. It's very strong in him. This is probably one of the best examples you'll see. The other thing we see is the snippy head shakes. See, for example, there the head shakes. They're very plateau velocity, dismissive, sassy head shakes. So that gives us the FI signals and the TE signals. Now, as for the perception axis, again, we see this taut orbital area here with the sharp outer edges of the brow, while at the same time, there is a lowering or a hooding of the upper eyelid, the pretarsals. So this is a very characteristic uh, NISE ocular tension combined with a very characteristic TEFI mouth tension. Okay, so he checks all the boxes of a TENI voltology. Now let's see what he says psychologically. I think that China is attempting to run a bit of a natural experiment in what we might think of as a more authoritarian innovation-driven economy, whether so we have here economics. Whether, for instance, enormous state or that can produce more than just short-term returns. Of course, if you plow money into a specific sector that you've identified. So this is very typical of TE, right? If you do this, this will happen. Cause and effect, again, the mechanics. So the mechanistic mindset is present within him, just as it was in the other TE leads. But I wonder if we can get something else from this video as well. As being you know, high potential or high risk for you, but whether that will actually create a long-term innovation-driven economy, as they say, I think certainly too early to tell. So he's analyzing China in terms of like future intentions, and he's evaluating whether or not those future intentions are sound and whether or not they'll get to those future intentions from the causalities that are at play, almost like playing forward the script of the causality that is in motion and estimating whether or not it will have the intended result at the end. Evaluating the long-term effects of economic policies. I have noticed over the past year other fundamental forms of, of the new economy that that is a really central plank of Xi Jinping's vision of the world. So again, future sight, future forecasting. I began to study China and think about the extraordinary transformation that China has gone through. Those head shakes are very solid. Over the past 40 years, it immediately became clear to me that there were some fundamental questions that historians, my training, had an opportunity. So he's a historian by training. Historian. Opportunity to begin researching and learning of China's economy today. How had that socialist market economy come into being, developed over 20 or 30 years of debate and policy contestation? I realized that one part of the story we didn't know much about, but that was central at the time, was the role of economists from outside of This was an extraordinary Outside of China, it cut off a bit, but fairly broad and deep effort to learn from economists of a very wide ideological background. So there was a broad and deep effort to learn from economists of a wide background. A historian could just focus on the specific facts that took place, but he seems to also be taking into account the intersectional events, cross-disciplinary influences that led to a certain outcome emerging, which is something that might be worth just kind of shelving there for a sec. We might come back to that in a bit. Chinese leadership done on their own terms. Really from the moment that Mao died, the Chinese officials and economists began to try to figure out who they should bring, who should they be talking to about the way in which their economy could begin to grow because, of course, China was, was very poor in 1978 per capita GDP of about 175 US. So he also has facts and figures, so that's important. Let me add that as well. So I'm going to add here numbers and dates. Okay, I'm going to stop here for a sec and give you a bit more context on who he is. So on his website, juliangowords.com, it says that he is a senior fellow for China studies. He also happens to be a lecturer, as we see here. So foreign relations, China, lecturer. 
and he's also an author. He's written a book called Unlikely Partners, Chinese Reforms, Western Economists, and the Making of Global China. Another book by him is called Never Turn Back, China and the Foreign History of the 1980s. In this one, he tracks a moment in history in which China was a bit more open to ideas and not so communist, and then it rewrote the history of its own nation to fit the new modern agendas. So more than just being a historian necessarily, I almost see him as also being a bit of a political theorist or a social theorist. He has some crossover with uh, human psychology and social studies. So I'm going to put here psychology and sociology. And then something else that's quite interesting about him is that he actually wrote a book of poems on poetryfoundation.org. Julian Gewertz is listed as a poet and a historian. And it says that his poems have appeared in AGNI, Boston Review, and a bunch of other places. So I'm going to put here poet. That's an interesting combination, right? On one hand, he's a very mechanically minded economist, historian. But then in this other side of him, he also has this tendency to view humanity and society from a more sociological and psych psychological perspective. And he also has a focus on poetry. And I think that actually is similar to Ben Shapiro, if you think about it, because despite the fact that he knows the numbers, he knows the facts, he knows the bills, the names of all these things, he focuses on a lot more on sociology. So actually, I want to add that. I'm going to add here sociology to Ben Shapiro because he also has this focus on how society is being influenced by ideas and how that is tracking forward. So both of them have this focus on how ideas are changing society. So I think that's enough of Julian. Let's move on to the next sample. Here we have Jair Bolsonaro. This is the president of Brazil. If I were all we see I the snippy head shakes, the head nods of J.E. We see the, the, the dismissive shoulder shrugs, the hands. So a very assertive, very commanding energy. So we see that very snippy, sassy, plateau voltology of T.E. as well as the mouth tension of T.E. and F.I. where we have the, the four-point pulling creating this effect here. Now the eyes for him also have a tautness in the orbital area, as we see here, as well as this intense scowling. Now intense is actually a technical term in the codifier and it means the, the collision of muscles that happens from the tension of the orbital collapsing with, let's say, the frontalis muscle. And here in this shot, for example, you can see how he has this upper eyelid somewhat lowered over the top of the iris, that hypnotic look. Now, some people might get confused with him because he has what looks to be this kind of slant on the side of his eyes. But in, in his case, that's part of his ocular anatomy. And in the codifier, we have a method for accounting for an anatomical differences like this, which allow us to see the true type of the individual, despite the fact that people around the world have very different kinds of faces. So this is what it looks like when you have a TE and I, but with a little bit of a, of a naturally slanting to the eyes. Notice that this slant doesn't give the confused look, the concerned look of the TES size. You see the difference here? These do not have the intensity, while this one has the intensity of the NI and SE oscillation. Now, because he doesn't speak English, I'm going to rely a bit more on the Wikipedia pages for him. Here he says he's a politician and a retired military officer, president of Brazil, politician, retired military officer. Now that's interesting, right? Military officer has some intersection with the mechanistic mentality of the TE type in general, where there's instructions to carry out, there's causalities to implement, there's a lot of analysis of information that goes into the final action, and then there's just the execution of that action in the real world stage. So it takes a certain kind of personality to be a military officer, and he seems to have that personality. So he's also a conservative, and in that way he's similar to Ben Shapiro, who's also a conservative. Now, in this very video, you see here the subtitle says uh, Trump of the Tropics. That actually comes from part of a comparison that people have made between Donald Trump and him, seeing him as similar to Donald Trump in terms of policy and so forth, which actually comes back to Ben Shapiro, who was also in many ways pro-Trump. Not everything is pro-Trump, but similar views on some things. And also, by the way, we'll see later on that Donald Trump's type is not too dissimilar to theirs. But so what characterizes this Trump comparison? Well, in his case, one of the ways that I can access that is from this BBC article. So it says here that the far right former army captain has uh, insulted women and homosexuals. As you guys know, there's a lot of controversy around Donald Trump's language. He tends to openly insult uh, women specifically. 
And that actually has some echoes of Ben Shapiro in the sense that Ben Shapiro also tends to say things such as... I mean, I would say some circumstance, but the Democratic Party would have to stop being insane. So again, when it comes to insults, uh, Ben Shapiro seems to dish them out quite commonly. Now, let me be clear, none of what I'm saying here is politically motivated one way or another. I'm simply observing the fact that these individuals seem to be very candid in their speech and what they say, and they seem to have very little reservation at all when it comes to how they articulate what they feel about something. So I'm gonna put here blunt also for him. And you know what, I'm gonna put political incorrectness in parentheses so that we know exactly what we mean. I think that's a good way to summarize that. Reading more of this article, it also says that he's been described as having excessive ambition, which relates to how, for example, he's demanded higher pay when he was a soldier. And as it reads here, it says that he has shown signs of excessive ambition to be financially and economically successful. Now, it's hard to quantify this as a psychological attribute, but I'm going to summarize it as a thirst for power. Thirst for power and also desire for economic success. So again, I'm not concerned in this video about politics, but I'm interested in the psychology that these individuals have. And this psychology seems to be one that desires to have control. So I'm gonna add here thirst for power and control. I think that's enough for this one. Next, we're gonna look at Mike Huckabee jobs scarce and moving away and making it hard for Americans to earn a decent living. We can do better than that. We've always done better than that. The Voltology is super clear with this one. You have here the snippy head shakes, the shoulder shrugs. You have here the, notice the way the head jut, juts forward, very plateau velocity, uh, very sassy. And you have the wobbling lips here as well. And you have the ocular tension as well. Look at the sharpness of the outer edges and the way that the upper eyelid is slightly lowered over the eyes in that intense look right there, for example. Yeah, very clear. So this is a very clear gamma type and a very clear TENI. So let's listen to what he has to say. Jobs scarce and moving away and making it hard for Americans to earn a decent living. So he's talking about jobs and their scarcity and how Americans are struggling to make a decent living which are all part and parcel of the politician shade, but also in his case, the conservative shade, which worries about offshoring jobs and wanting to return resources back within the borders. So Mike Huckabee, politician, Republican, conservative. We can do better than that. We've always done better than that. And I'm prepared to lead because I've done it before. And I understand what it means to make tough decisions, follow through and get results. I, again, the framing to make tough decisions, follow through and get results. Tough decisions is very similar to Hillary Clinton's book called Hard Choices. So make tough decisions, follow through and get results. That get results part is very, very much a, a TE motif. This bottom lining, we're, we're seeing a lot of that here. I don't think the presidency is an entry level job. Uh, I don't think it's a job somebody just walks into and learns when they get there. And having been a governor for 10 and a half years in a very, very tough state where the Clinton political machine dominated the landscape, I know what it's like to go into a corrupt and hostile environment. Whoever goes into Washington as president is going to go into a very corrupt and hostile environment. But if you know how to lead and know how to work with people, know how to bring people together to get results, we can get... Again, to get results. Whether it's carrying out the death penalty or... Uh, dealing with a crisis where a tornado has struck your state and you're required to lead and marshal resources. Marshal resources. A marshal is like a military officer. So again, this is motif of a more militant personality. So I'm going to put here marshal resources. And there's a few others I want to add. I wouldn't be running if I didn't think that I could do the job. That itself is a choice of words. So again, thinking of things as jobs. So I'm going to put here, I can do the job. I can marshal resources, I can do the job. That's very much how he's framing his sale to you. A few of the things about him, aside from being an American politician, is that he's a Baptist minister, political commentary, we understand, and a bassist. So Baptist minister, political commentator, and bassist. Yeah, let's add that in, why not? Okay, so I could go on and show you even more of these TE and I politicians and economists, but I think that is enough to get the point across. So to summarize, there's this shade of TE and I that is very political in nature, as we would expect of conductor types, but specifically they're political as well as focused on economics, on economic strategies. And like their TESI cousins, they have a lot of focus on mechanistic thought. But we did see a little bit of a difference in the sense that there is more focus, especially with these two, on 
the kind of evolution of ideas across populations and tracking that in the past and how it influenced the past, but also how that ideas and those evolutions of ideas are affecting the, uh, the future. Or, and, and we did see more of that global societal impact focus and concern when it came to the beta conductors. So that would be the FE and I and the NIFE. They seem to have more of a focus on that element as well. So we are seeing that they kind of fit in the middle of the TESIs in, in their logistical mechanical thought, but also with the FE and I's in their more globalized perspectives and their more interconnected analysis of the effects that things have on each other. But okay, as with all the types, there's more than one shade that defines the type and not everybody that is TE&I is gonna be a politician or an economist. Now we're gonna take a look at some other shades that might pop up in the TE&I types. Beginning here with Sam Vaknin. But I think because I constantly exercise my brain, I mean, I read and write and, and analyze and every, well over 10 hours a day. Uh, snippy head shakes, sassy movements, the mouth tension, the wobbling here. Yeah, the wobbles are very strong there. So strong head shakes, strong accentuator motions of the, of the hands. So all the JE energy is there as well. Again, TE and I voltology, solid. Now let's see what he has to say. But I think because I constantly exercise my brain, I mean, I read and write and, and analyze and every, well over 10 hours a day. Read, write, analyze, and use my brain over 10 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I do nothing else but this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, sorry, 180, 190, 185. What he's talking about there are IQ points. 180, 190, 185. Those are the three scores that he got on IQ tests, which means that his, he's basically he's a genius, having essentially one of the top 10 IQs in the entire world. And so in this video, he's talking partially about his experience being somebody with such a high IQ. The highest IQs in the world, yes. There was a bit of panic. Right. Uh, there were no protocols what to do with gifted children. There were no institutions. Yeah. There were there was no conveyor conveyor belt, if you wish. Mm -hmm. So they the whole quote says that there's no process from which you can put a high IQ child on one side and get genius on the other on the other end. So he didn't have a system that could lead him to maximize his talents. But the use of the conveyor belt metaphor is very mechanistic. And it's very in line with TE to use that metaphor to describe something. So they went, they opted for the worst conceivable solution, as we know today. Mm -hmm. We know that this is, should never be done. Right. They took me out of my peer group. Mm -hmm. um, they catapulted me to the end of the primary school, because mm -hmm. technically they had to do that. But starting at age nine, I, I was forced to go to university. I mean, everyone around me was... Um, 20 plus. In Israel, you serve three years in the army. Mm -hmm. So you start university at the age of 21. Right. Everyone around me was 20 plus. So genius IQ of 185. Went to university at a very young age. 21, 25, 22. Yeah. Most women in this group did not find me interesting. <laughs> I don't know why. I thought I was cute. So and I was nine already. You know, <laughs> truly formed men. <laughs> So seriously, I mean, I, I didn't develop the necessary social skills to interact with peers. Underdeveloped social skills? So with, even, with, even though you have... I'm limited because yeah. uh, IQ tests in the West mm -hmm. are geared towards measuring specific capabilities, mm -hmm. mainly analytic capabilities, mm -hmm. but not, for example, synthetic, yeah. not creative capabilities. So you mm -hmm. can be a genius uh, at the piano, mm -hmm. genius painter, and mm -hmm. still your IQ would be 60. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. It's, um, it doesn't mean much. It means yeah. that you would be good probably with language, with mathematics, yeah. so on. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I excelled in physics. and Excelled in language, mathematics and physics? But they were like the elite of the psychological profession. Yeah. I was tested and examined by everyone. I was a yeah. circus freak. Yeah. It was an absolute circus freak. I was moved from place to place, from Tel Aviv to Haifa to Beersheba to, you know, everywhere. Everyone wanted to see me. Everyone wanted to talk to me. I was... I was um, I think I was a celebrity before the age of celebrities. Don't forget that I'm as old as some of the dinosaurs. And, um, <laughs> well, I've met some of them. Actually, uh, that's the second time already he has this sense of humor. There is a degree of uh, PE in his energy, as you'll notice. For example, even though it's very clearly uh, TE dominant, you see earlier here with the hand gestures. So everywhere, everyone wanted to see me. Everyone went... You see the, the casual hands, right? Notice that. All compared to these guys, 
he is a little bit more loose in his body mannerisms and he has more of a sense of humor. So you're already starting to get a sense of these subtypes within the TE and I just by these slight deviations in voltology. But these slight variations are actually not at the level of being of a different development. They're still standard development. We're going to see in the future examples of non-standard developments where they have much more of this energy involved. Don't forget that I'm as old as some of the dinosaurs. And um, <laughs> well, I've met some of them personally. I even gave therapy to one, <laughs> committed suicide. In the... <laughs> so it worked. Now that's, that's a dark sense of humor. So I'm going to put here dark. That has some overlap with the bluntness of the other uh, TE and I's that we saw. This kind of lack of filter seems to be even more strong in the TE and I's than in the TESI's. Me, me good, you bad. Yes. Yeah. It's the beginning of narcissism. Yes. The beginning of narcissism, he said, is the belief that uh, me equals good, you equals bad. An external enemy, an external threat, so migrants, uh, the Jews, or whatever. Mm. I mean, so the beginning. Uh, so, by the way, now he's talking about his narcissistic diagnosis. So he's a diagnosed narcissist. So I'm going to add here narcissistic personality disorder. And, and there are other videos of him, by the way, where he talks about this and how it is that the way that he grew up contributed to him developing the disorder. Whether or not there may also be a higher inclination, just as we said that the any leads are a little bit more inclined to towards attention deficit disorders. There may be a higher percentage of TE and I with narcissism. There is something very aggressive and assertive and bold about these types, which, which might lend itself to that. That will be a fascinating subject for a future study. Unfortunately, I can't give you any more than just speculation at the moment. So let's not extrapolate too much from this, but let's continue. I think, I think ultimately um, most societies will become narcissistic because the threats are real. Yes. So most societies, but what I don't know mm. is if, the, if whole societies and collectives will be pushed beyond the point of path psychopathy. Uh, again, he's talking a bit about collectives and societies as a whole and uh, endemic problems in the social sphere. So when he talks about narcissism, he doesn't just talk about his own experience. He talks about how societies are geared up to create narcissists. So in a way, that's more of a sociology focus again. I'm going to add here sociology. If you have a single psychopath on the block, mm -hmm. Adolf Hitler, mm -hmm. you can defeat him with another psychopath, maybe mm -hmm. Stalin. But what do you do if everyone is a psychopath? All right. And that's Sam Backman. That was quite an interesting deviation, right? So these guys were all politicians and they all have economic focuses. And he's more on the purely analytical and mechanistic side. Very good at math, very good at physics, but he also has different egoic issues. And I also wanted to include another TENI male here to show them in another occupation. This is Aaron Sorkin, and he is a film producer. Came to New York, had a whole bunch of survival jobs. I bust tables. I very quickly you see the snippy head shakes, very sassy plateau movements. The scowl has the intense scowling pattern of NI. The the wobbling of the lips you can see very strongly going everywhere pulling in four directions, very similar to the others, super identical. All of these seem to be really the same person to me. Let's see what he says. Survival jobs. I bust tables. I uh, uh, drove uh, a cab. I dressed up as a moose and passed out leaflets in Times Square. So basically a bunch of odd jobs. So he's had survival jobs as a waiter, a cab driver, and dressed up as a moose. But mostly my steadiest survival job was working as a bartender in Broadway theaters. And bartender. I wrote most of A Few Good Men on cocktail napkins at the Palace Theater during the first act of La Caja Fall. So he's a, like I said, a playwright. He writes plays. He called me and said, this is terrific. We're going to send this to our West Coast office and we think we can get you staffed up on a TV show. I wasn't cocky. I was just, uh, I guess, naive. I was just about plays. So I said, well, that sounds nice, but what about doing the play? Remember, I'm still a bartender, kind of shrugging off a we think you can get you staffed on a TV show. That night. So that's interesting. He turns it down because he wants it to be a play. So there are many different psychological aspects that go into that. You might say it's, it's very stubborn or very insistent. So there's an inflexibility there. So I'm going to write here inflexible, insistent or slash stubborn. I think that's the best way I can capture what it is that he said. My agent, he happened to be standing next to a woman who was the development director for a legendary producer named David Brown, who produced The Sting, who produced The Verdict, who produced The Jaws. 
The development person said to my agent, David had a great time making the verdict. He really wants to do another courtroom drama. Do you know of anything? My agent literally had my A Few Good Men script. <laughs> four days later, and it only took four days because David Brown was on a safari in Africa. David came back, he wanted to meet with me. And here's where things got really crazy. David said, I love this and I want to option the film rights. I'm still a bartender at the Palace Theater. And I said, well, the thing is, I really want to see this done as a play. <laughs> you turn down these enormous offers because it's not exactly what you want. I want to see this done as a play. He said, well, what if I were to do it as a play first? I still didn't jump at it. I said, well, have you ever produced a play before? He said, no, but what if I brought in Robert Whitehead? To now, see, he managed to get his, his uh, show done, but the fact that he was stubborn gave him negotiating power. So he said, no, that's not good enough. No, that's not good enough. And then they raised the stakes. They gave him a higher offer, a bigger offer until he finally took it. So it actually worked in his favor for him to hold off and in a way get the best deal possible. I'm not sure in his case if he was trying to trade up to a better offer each time. That could have been a tactic he was implicitly doing, but he doesn't seem to describe it that way. I'm going to write a few things here. First of all, I'm going to put storytelling. And I've also seen his works and he's a, a, a fantastic director. So we learned that Aaron Sorkin is, like I said, a playwright, a screenwriter, and a film director. So I'm going to put that here. And he's earned an Academy Award, Emmy Awards, and Golden Globe Awards. So multi-award winning. All right, that wraps up our TENI males. Now we're going to take a look at the TENI female samples. Just beginning here first with Kristen Hadid. Beginning, just because I needed to weave people. The head shake, you can see the, the snippiness and the head shake and the head pushes. People out quickly. And then I realized as time went on that it didn't really define. As well as the wobbling lips. Define who, right there. Who someone was or, or their heart. You know, what does a 3.5 yeah. GPA really mean? Very strong head pushes. Like she drills it forward like this. Very characteristic of JE lead, but specifically TE lead. So we actually don't even have it anymore. Again, the jittery head. And we hire for heart, a desire to learn and grow, and just really... And the intensity of the eyes, you can also see here the, the orbital area is taut and the upper eyelid tends to be lowered. Yep, so very clear TE and I voltology. Let's take a look at what she says. Company when I was 19. She says that she started a company when she was 19. <laughs> Already have to add that. Started a company when she was 19. I was in college at the University of Florida, studying finance, thought I wanted to be in investment banking. Banking. There we go. And walked into the mall, fell in love with a pair of jeans that I could not afford. I really wanted them, so I thought, what is something I can do to make enough money to buy them? And putting an ad on Craigslist to clean a house was my first idea. So not sure why, but that's what I did. I put an ad on Craigslist. I cleaned someone's house. I bought the jeans. I thought that was it. And really, it was just the beginning. So after that, I kept cleaning her house. She told her friends about me. And before I knew it, I was a cleaning person. And I hired employees and decided to turn down a job at grad in finance at my graduation because there was something about this cleaning company that I loved. She's telling a story about how just the desire to get a pair of jeans in the mall motivated her to essentially start a business as a, as a cleaning person. It, the way that she says it is very much kind of unaware of how much harder it would be for a, a normal person to do something like that and how it is not a very typical way to solve a problem, although for her it is. I picked up a little bit of the same thing when Aaron Sorkin was telling his story about how he had these survival jobs. He went from being a waiter to a cab driver. He dressed up as a moose. Then he was a bartender. Then on the bartender napkins, he would write down his place. And he seems kind of oblivious to the fact that he's being so conscientious. He's doing so much, but he kind of shrugs it off as a, as a no big deal. This tends to be something that when, when a function is the lead process, you don't really realize how what you're doing, which is not a big deal to you, is actually a big deal to other people. So she went from wanting to buy a pair of jeans to thinking, how do I resolve this problem? And then she's like, I need to get a job. I, I get hired. Okay, I get hired. And then, okay, I have more work. So I need more employees. Let me just get some employees. All of this kind of cascades forward from this uh, doer attitude of just solving the next problem in front of you, reacting to the immediacy of the situation, which is actually their SE, by the way, 
and just kind of going along with the next thing, problem solving, problem solving, problem solving, in, in a way not really being aware of where they're going along the way, just realizing, oh, this works. So this is very characteristic of the te and psychology. There's the SE hunt for what you want. In this case, it would be the, the pair of jeans. Oh, that's pretty, I want it. How do I get it? And then the powerhouse of TE comes to the rescue to attain that thing which their SE wants. Very immediately responding to wants, needs, and executing on those wants and needs until you end up somewhere where you weren't necessarily planning to get there, but it just kind of works. So I'm just going to call this a want leading to a solution, leading to attaining in, as a kind of problem solving strategy. Uh, I didn't know what it was, but it was more exciting to me. It was something I did at the beginning just because I needed to weed people out quickly. And then I realized as time went on that it didn't really define who, who someone was or, or... She's talking about what she did is she put a GPA of 3.5 or higher as a necessary requirement to get hired by her business, which is setting the merit bar pretty high there, right? I'm going to put high standards of competency requiring a 3.5 or higher GPA. I also need to add CEO of a cleaning company. Her heart, you know, what does a 3.5 GPA really mean? So we actually don't even have it anymore. And we hire for heart, a desire to learn and grow, and just really someone who we think will fit our culture and because it teaches us a lesson every time. And what's hard is when we're in a position of leadership or we see someone we care about failing, our, our natural instinct is to jump in and help them and save the day because we don't want to see someone we care about struggling. But when we let people fail and we let them struggle their way, they eventually figure it out. And even if they fall down, they... So that's interesting. She uh, lets people fail and lets them figure it out instead of trying to help them. That's a very meritocratic way of thinking. It's more kind of a, a tough love approach. So let people fail and learn from their mistakes. Don't intervene and save the day. Even if they fall down, they learn that they have to pick themselves back up and, and get through whatever that, that moment is. Picking oneself back up. And when they can do that, they look back and they say, hey, I did that by myself. So developing personal competency. She wants people to be able to pick themselves up and they only do that by allowing them to fail. And so it builds confidence and it teaches us that we can rely on ourselves to get through whatever it is that we're going through and it always teaches us a powerful lesson. So I think... I'm going to put this as self-strength, self-empowerment and self-dependence. Because when someone fails and they get through it, they're proud and they can say, I did that. And I job is to empower people, to believe in them, to believe in their potential and to help them realize that they are capable of achieving whatever it is that they are putting their minds to. So believe in your potential. You can achieve what you put your mind to. Beautiful. Okay, this is plenty. This is a lot. You can see a lot here that resonates with the other ones that we saw above. More so the other ones for implicitly applying these principles while well, she is more so explicitly conveying these philosophies. Because for example, with Mark Huckabee, when he says that I can do the job and I can make tough decisions, follow through and get results, that's the kind of competency that he values in himself. And he wants to let you know that he is competent. So being able, being competent is very important to the te and I's, it seems. Okay, now we're going to move on to the next sample. This is Megan Kelly. She is a journalist. It has not been an easy year, I mean, that's for sure. But one of the themes of Settle for More is that adversity is an opportunity. And in fact, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I... Adversity is an opportunity. And she said she wrote a book called Settle for More. And you can see the book right here. It's a New York Times bestseller. Now, I was just mentioning how Aaron Sorkin, when he was trying to get somebody to make his play, was not settling. And that eventually made it to where he got the best possible deal because he insisted on having his script be written as a play and a play directed by somebody who he really admires and wants to direct it. That not settling is part of what led to the success. So there's parity between Aaron Sorkin here being inflexible and stubborn and insistent and also settle for more. And in fact, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I feel like the younger kids today <laughs> are getting too soft. I worry about the millennial generation. And we have that was a bit of a parody. I'm going to add that there as well. Now, she said that the kids these days are getting too soft. So kids are getting too soft. That has a connection to what we saw with Kristen Hadith here saying that we got to let people fail and make mistakes. They're both saying a similar thing in different ways. And we had to function in the face of that adversity. 
And so in a way, this past year has been a chance to build those muscles, right? <laughs> Had plenty of adversity. And it's almost like you can't grow and become stronger unless you have some difficult situations thrown. So growing stronger through difficult situations being thrown at you. If you, if you think the Access Hollywood bus and the 12 female accusers coming forward and doing and all the other stuff didn't bring Trump down, you think my book would, um, I think you're deluding yourself. I knew in the moment, as soon as I saw the that complaint and the complaints that came out in the day and, and the days thereafter that I had a decision to make. Because 10 years earlier, when I was a first year reporter at Fox News, it had happened to me too. And it culminated in an incident in his office in January 2006. So now she's talking about the Me Too movement. It's where he tried to get physical with me, to kiss me, and then I pushed him away. He tried to kiss me again. I pushed him away again. He asked me when my contract was up, and then he tried to kiss me for the third time. I pushed him away. I walked out the door, and that I should try to avoid him. Forgave what had happened between us, because he never did retaliate against me, and he did promote me based on merit. Um, however, that didn't change my reaction when I saw the lawsuit. Okay, so I'm gonna write here a Me Too movement supporter. And of course, I can't forget to put journalist, a news reporter, and she is into politics. Great, okay, let's move on. Let's take a look now at another reporter. This one is Nora O'Donnell. His affection for these soldiers is mm -hmm. genuine. I mean, he served on the front lines. He did two tours in Afghanistan. Um, this is not some pet project of his. I mean, you can see the top square effect here, like there, the raised outer edges and the sharp ocular tension. Um, this is not some pet project of his. I mean, this is something he created several years ago. And there's that very well accentuated head shaking, a head nodding and gesticulation. So focusing on what she says for a sec for these soldiers is mm -hmm. genuine. I mean, he served on the front lines. He did two tours in Afghanistan. Um, this is not some pet project of his. I mean, this is something he created several years ago. And I think as I asked him that question, do you realize what you've created? I meant that because when I was there, it means for each uh, was he went over, he, you know, gave him a big hug and then he started to tease a blind veteran saying a USA shirt. But that's the kind of jocularity that, that Prince uh, Harry has. And as another veteran said to me, he's our brother. So this isn't giving us too much information about her psychology, but she is talking about politics and military veterans. So naturally being in the news, she also has some overlap with that political shade. So we're just going to add some basics here. A journalist, news reporter, politics. Okay, we could go a bit more into that, but I think we understand already what this shade is about. Megyn Kelly and her are practically the same person. They both work in the same occupation and look at them. They're practically the same. So we're going to move on to the third one. This is Carly Fiorina. I think we're running out of time to get some really important lead to the wobbling to lips here. You can see where it's not just professional politics. head shakes, step forward sassiness when their nation calls them, but people who have the orbital areas, tautness, slightly lowered upper eyelids, very clear TE and I voltology, very similar to these women as well. As for her psychology, one thing you might know is that she ran for the presidency in 2016 as a Republican. So already here, we can put a few things. So Republican, conservative, politician, presidential candidate. But what you may not know about her is that she is first and foremost a businesswoman and is best known for having been the CEO of Hewlett Packard or HP. This is a businesswoman CEO of a tech company turned politician turned presidential candidate. So you have the combination of basically all the executive things you could imagine lumped together in the same person, going from the business sector to the political sector. So this is one very accomplished woman. And it even says, so here she's the first woman to lead a Fortune Top 20 company. So businesswoman, CEO of HP, and leader of a Fortune Top 20 company. I think we're running out of time to get some really important things we need to return to a citizen government where it's not just professional politicians who step forward when their nation calls them, but people who have relevant experience from other aspects of life. I started out as a secretary in a little nine person real estate firm. That story is only possible in America. But that experience from secretary to CEO gives me an understanding of how the economy works. Well, in the five and a half gives her an understanding of how the economy works, so an economic focus. 
Packard, we doubled the company from 45 billion. We went from market laggard in every product category to market leader in every product category and in every market in which we competed. I'll run on that record all day long. Packard. Yes. At the time. Okay, so she turned around the company. She made it much more effective, efficient. She helped double the value of the company, doubled company value. I can't forget uh, to put here uh, technology as the platform that she works in. So many more people would have lost their jobs and we wouldn't have been able to create the jobs we did. Continue to trivialize women by saying, you know, all you can. There's a lot of talk about jobs with TE leads. Thinking in terms of jobs makes sense because they themselves think of life as a series of tasks to get done care about is one is guess what they care about jobs the economy education health care immigration national security every issue is a woman's issue first of all our rates are too high we all know that we now have for example the highest business tax rate in the world and in an era where we have to compete for every job and work hard once again the jobs so job creation focus i'm going to stop there with the political shade i think we understand fairly well what this shade is about and it's very similar to the shade that we saw above here with these men but the women te and i's are also in other areas aside from politics so here we're going to see an example of that with lucille ball this is the actress behind lucy in i love lucy i was really having a baby it was really my last show before i had the bizarre great thing that and the fact that we had an audience always as a barometer quite a scatter i think you can see the sassy head shakes and the sharpness of the eyes pretty clearly there As a and here the wobbling lips the the squareness and the the sassy head shakes right there so i think you can see that pretty clearly by now so let's focus on a little bit of what she says it was really my last show before i had it was our great thing that and the fact that we had an audience always as a barometer quite a scatter brain i'm not as scheming so she's saying she's not as scatterbrained as Lucy, and she's not as scheming as Lucy. Kept on working. I had no plan. I had no format for that. Kept each other working. So this is about how she started. Basically, she was directing I Love Lucy while acting in it. So I'm going to put here TV show director. So just kept working, kept each other working. So Lucille Ball was an American actress, comedian, and producer, nominated for 13 Primetime Emmy Awards. Actress, comedian, let's change this to producer, nominated for 13 Emmy Awards. We also saw a multi-award winning TE&I with uh, Aaron Sorkin. So they tend to do pretty good in the TV world. And lastly, we have here Ashley Judd. She is also an actress. I was asking you yesterday what I'm doing this year, and I said, well, I'm watching the men's basketball team at the University of Kentucky. Top square. And in the student section, it's where I belong. Here, for example, yeah, very clear four point pulling. In fact, I don't think I can get tickets. Snippy head shakes. Alabama that's at Rupp Arena. Head and pushes. Said, no problem, I'll stand in the student section. Gesticulations. I, I don't think I can get tickets for the game against Alabama that's at Rupp Arena. And I said, no problem, I'll stand in the student section. It's where I belong anyway. I mean, my behavior <laughs> is quite. Sense of humor. Actress, sense of humor. You but we're all, all us fans. We're pretty. Uh, Sometimes. Does a fat lady sweat at a dance? Of course I want to go undefeated. Of course I want to go undefeated. Mm -hmm. I want in my lifetime for us to, you know, finally win more national championships than UCLA holds. I want it all and I want it now. <laughs> so a path appear. Okay, I like that one. I want it all and I want it now. Yeah, there's something about that that really speaks to the Gamma Quadrant specifically the extroverted gammas and more specifically the TE and I's. And as we see with this list, they are pretty good at getting what they want. So, so a path appears is, as you put it, a docu-series that has an additional subtitle, which is creating opportunity, transforming lives. Creating opportunity, transforming lives. This is not her work, by the way, but she's involved in a project that is called a path appears. And she's talking a little about it in this segment. And it is about intense hardship, much of it societal and structural, but individuals who are able to transcend. And so again, transcending hardship. I'm going to put ability to transcend intense hardship. Transcendable and live lives of great resilience and service. 
Now, I could continue on for much longer, but I hope you can see with these brief views at all these people, how similar their psychologies really are. Every one of these individuals has something in common with the ones above or below them. Now, up until this point, the majority of the TE&Is that we've been looking at have been unseely in their emotive expressions, but we also need to see what they look like in their seely form, which is the more unguarded, vulnerable, emotional attitude. And we're going to start that by taking a look at Anne Romney. This is Mitt Romney's wife. Of things you cannot teach him. He, it's in his bones. See the but rattling head shakes? For, the, for uh, a current events, everything else. Head pushes. Situation. And I, th I see sometimes, and, and I haven't watched a lot of this debate prep, but in... The wobbling lips also? In previous here. debate preps. Yeah, very wobbly. he is the devil's ad. He makes everyone around him be as on their toes. Head shakes, and as sharp, head pushes. And is prepared. Plateau velocity. Going to be the one that's going to weigh in with Mitt on that. So this video shows her TE and I Voltology in an unmistakable way. But in order to show you the sealiness, I really want to switch to a different video where she is expressing that sealy energy at its maximum. So we're going to switch for a second to this video where she's giving a speech. I'm going to point out a few things while we watch. I can't wait to see what we're going to all do together. This is going to be so exciting. <laughs> Just so you all know, the hurricane has hit landfall, and I think we should all take this moment and recognize that fellow Americans are in its path and just hope and pray that all are remain safe and no life is lost and no property is lost. So we should all be thankful for this great country and grateful for our first responders and all that keep us safe in this wonderful country. Now, these are all things that are very nice, they're very sweet, they're very kind. There's no reason why a TE and I can't say these things. So again, systems that treat F-ness as nothing else except um, caringness and compassion and harmony seeking will mistype people like Anne Romney because she is openly compassionate and, and sympathetic and sweet. If that's your criteria for F, then you're making a categorical error of disallowing genetically born T-types from being that way emotionally, being openly harmonious and so forth, which doesn't seem like that would be the way biology would work, right? That, that's something of a personal choice that you can make. I want to talk to you tonight not about politics and not about party. And while there are many important issues we'll hear discussed in this convention and throughout this campaign, tonight I want to talk to you from my heart about our hearts. See, there's nothing in what she said there that could not be said by a TE and I. In fact, the candidness in which she expresses it is very FI in nature. This very radiating honesty, which we saw with the FI and E's in the previous videos. Now, as far as a voltological analysis goes, I want you to pay attention to her voice because that's one of the ways that we distinguish sealy and unsealy. Notice how it kind of rattles and becomes more sensitive when she says our hearts. Tonight, I want to talk to you from my heart. There. About our hearts. When she says our hearts, there's a kind of breaking or shattering of composure, which is part of that candid vulnerability. <laughs> and then the breathy, like we saw with the original FI users in the previous videos. They are here in neighborhoods across Tampa and all across America. The parents who lie awake at night side by side, wondering how they'll be able to pay the mortgage or make the rent. The single dad who's working extra hours tonight so that his kids can buy some new clothes to go back to school, can take a school trip or play a sport. But notice, even though she's soft, she's talking about work. Again, the kind of struggles she's pointing out are very logistical challenges that people are facing. I have been all across this country, and I know a lot of you guys. <laughs> There's the voice again, becoming uh, sprite-like or breathy. So that's Anne Romney, a super clear example that it is possible to be TE and I and the sweetest, warmest person. So I'm going to add here politics, wife of presidential candidate, a team member of Mitt Romney's presidential campaign. And I don't, I don't just want to say wife of Mitt Romney because she does more than just be a wife. And she is actually involved in the process of encouraging him and making sure things are run smoothly. And that is actually an occupation that takes a certain talent 
which she definitely has. Uh, so speaking from the heart about our hearts, concern for the logistical well-being of families. I want to talk to you about love. What's another phrase she said? And economy. Right. So now that you've been introduced to the Sealy TENIs, I want to show you another one. This one is Wendy Walsh. If he likes me, why doesn't he call me back? Wobbling lips. I get. Here, for example, they open up vertically. And here you can see the wobbling lips. Here you see the pulling of the bottom two. And as far as her ocular focus, we can see again the sharp eye area, the orbital area being pulled taut. But let's take a look at the psychology. This is probably one of the most common questions I get from women. If he likes me, why doesn't he call me back? We had a great date. It happens all the time. A woman has one, two, three, four dates with a guy, and then he seems to fall off the face of the planet. Go so by the way, Wendy Walsh is a love expert, a relationship expert. So like Anne Romney, there is a love focus here. Now, she's actually written several books, and these are some of the titles of her books. This one is called The 30-Day Love Detox. Cleanse yourself of bad boys, cheaters, and men who won't commit. This title already has a lot of things going on. First of all, 30-day anything is a regimented mentality, right? Like a 30-day plan that has the procedural nature of JE. And this is another book by her called The Boyfriend Test. How to evaluate his potential before you lose your heart. Now, this is very funny to me because, again, the use of a test is in some ways very mechanical. Here is a protocol you can follow to test, like as if with the clipboard to see if he's the right one for you. That kind of methodology for figuring out love is very impersonal. So it's like an impersonal TE way of solving the love problem, the, the matchmaking problem. So this book itself kind of screams TE lead wanting to find love. The evaluation of potential also has parity with the meritocratic focus that we saw with the TENIs. So for example, with Kristen Hadid, how she would require a 3.5 GPA or higher, there is this standard setting with TENIs. So you can see that even though she's talking about love as a topic, she's doing it in a very TE way. Because it's not like FE or FI has a monopoly on love. Every type encounters the problems of love and the problems of intimacy. And each type, even the impersonal types, are going to want to approach it in their own way using their own creative solutions that align with their own cognition. So the 30 day love detox, the boyfriend test, how to evaluate his potential before you lose your heart. Going off radio completely and they're thinking, was it something I said? Well, here's what you need to know about male psychology to understand how they work. Men don't commit because they found the one that you might be, right? Instead, they commit when they hit a certain state of readiness. Now, what creates their state of readiness? It may be age, it may be their financial situation, their level of education, it may be peer pressure, maybe all their peer guys are getting married or getting serious girlfriends at that stage. So the most important thing I wanna tell you as a woman is if he doesn't call back, don't take it personally. Isn't that rule number one of life? It's don't take it personally, isn't that rule number one of life? Be strong, be self-confident, but also brush it off. Just brush it off, you can always, brush off people's bad opinions of you. And in, in, in a way, it's, it's an indifference towards what other people say about you, which is very much part of both the TE lead types. But if you spend your energy trying to get one guy to like you, you're wasting your time and you're not being efficient in the marketplace of love. There it is again. Notice the way that she phrases it. You're not being efficient in the marketplace of love. Again, of the framing thing, it's not about whether or not the topic she's talking about happens to be love, which is a, a nice, warm, fuzzy topic. She describes it as the marketplace and not being efficient in the marketplace of love. Not being efficient in the marketplace of love. If you're a headhunter and you're looking for a great candidate to maybe have a merger with you, you're going to interview well. You're going to find out if he's the one. You're not going to chase one candidate around, say, Wall Street and say, please come work for our company. Headhunting somebody, trying to make them work for you. The TNIs are politically minded and business minded in no matter what they do. It's part of their core psychology, which is just applied to whatever domain they happen to inhabit. It doesn't work that way. So go on with your life. Be confident. If you want to leave one last voicemail, voicemail, not a text on his machine or, or you know, one well worded email that go on with your life. Be confident. Perfect. Okay. 
with these two samples, I hope you can see what the TENI looks like when they apply their logistical mindset, their very economically driven psychology to matters other than necessarily business or, or politics. And so with that, we now know what the TENI looks like in male form, in female form, in unsealy form, and in sealy form. And that completes our first initial look at the TENI types. And in future videos, we'll go into the various development levels that they can have. But for now, we're going to move on to the next type.